Welcome to the Renovatio podcast. Renovatio is the journal of Zaytuna College. I'm Sarah Barnett, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Scott Kreider, who is currently a professor of English at the University of Dallas. An award-winning teacher, Dr. Kreider has run both the University of Dallas's writing program and its seven arts of language program. His areas of specialization are Shakespeare and rhetorical studies, and his other academic interests include the history and character of liberal education, and the English language Bible as literature. He's written multiple books on writing, rhetoric, and literature, including The Office of Assertion, An Art of Rhetoric for the Academic Essay, and The Art of Persuasion, Aristotle's Rhetoric for Everybody. Scott, welcome. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. You know, today we wanted to, to introduce our listeners to thinking about rhetoric in the context of writing as a life skill. So whether you are a former student, or you've never been a student, or you only have a high school diploma. Um, what, what do we mean when we say writing is a life skill? And just to set us off a little bit on this, I, I looked up life skills in the definition. So if we're talking about rhetoric, let's start with a good definition. Um, and I found one that I liked quite a, quite a lot. It's from the World Health Organization um, from the late 90s. Um, and it, they define life skills as social, psychosocial skills, and they separate them into five basic areas. So the life skills are decision making and problem solving, creative and critical thinking, communication and interpersonal skills, self awareness and empathy, and coping with emotions and coping with stress. Hmm. Now, I, as a writer, just think to myself, well, writing can help with all of those things. Um, but I want to try to convey that to our listeners today, step by step, especially thinking through this lens of rhetoric. So that leads to my question, how would you say that rhetoric benefits everyone, not just academics? How is that potentially a life skill for us as writers? Yeah, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful question. And um, I could see taking it up in, in one of two ways guided by, guided by Plato. One possibility would be to discuss uh, the private uh, avenue and the other, the public. And uh, maybe, we, maybe we could move from one to the, to the other. I, I found that your, your essay for the, the journal, Conversing with Oneself, really quite, quite compelling. And one of the reasons I did is that I, I felt like it was a challenge to the conception that I had a good challenge, a Socratic challenge for me to refine my own conception and try to deepen it. And I, I really enjoyed your, your explanation of this uh, writing space of the diary or the journal. Uh, which which we tend to think of as not rhetorical at all, uh, because uh, one one is one's own uh, one's own audience. Um, you know, leaving aside the fact that the journals that you explore all became public documents that others would read. Uh, but I think you make a good uh, make a good case that uh, without publication or even prior to publication, there's this fundamental life skill. Uh, that one can can acquire through keeping a, a diary or or a journal, and it I, I found it a really interesting idea. Not only because uh, I've had students keep uh, journals, especially during our our travel abroad program in Rome, uh, I I encourage uh, and work with them on keeping a keeping a Rome journal so that they can chart their, their reflections and their feelings and their experiences during, during the semester. But also because I thought to myself, well, if you're writing for yourself, is that a rhetorical, is that a rhetorical enterprise? And it, it helped me come to an idea I wouldn't have without putting your, your piece and mine into conversation. And that is that I was thinking that the, the best retor I think treats an audience um, as though that audience were uh, uh, oneself, uh, that uh, that you speak to another the way that you would want to be, the way that you would want to be spoken to or written to, 
Um, and, and then I got thinking, well, perhaps the, the uh, not contrary, but perhaps the counterpart to that is the kind of personal writing that, that, you, that you discuss, in which one treats oneself as another uh, and, and can, actually, can actually write um, and in first defamiliarizing oneself uh, from one's own experiences and reflections uh, by making it external to oneself in the way that you in the way that you talk about it through this extraordinary technology in the best sense of that word uh, uh, an, an art through this technology of of language and that this becomes in your conception a contemplative a contemplative experience and so the first, the first life skill that I would uh, recommend I owe, I owe to you, and that is to say, you know, here, here, uh, for, keeping a, for keeping a journal for all the reasons that you mention in your, uh, in your piece, what the study of rhetoric does to assist it, I think, uh, is, to, is, to, is to allow one or to teach one, really, how, how language itself is the way that we we speak not only to one another but to our but to ourselves. Like Whitman, we contain multitudes, uh, and it seems to me that talking to ourselves through writing uh, is is one way I think to employ uh, rhetoric in one of its highest in one of its highest forms. I was really struck by by Anne Frank's conception uh, of her of her diary as a friend, uh, mm -hmm. which I I thought really quite quite uh, extraordinary uh, and I couldn't I couldn't tell if uh, the diary was a way for her to become her own friend uh, which I, th I think is a really really intriguing a really intriguing idea first the making different or making other and then and then bringing bringing back into the same though now transformed by the contemplation that's occurred uh, but I, the, the idea that in private one might treat oneself as a friend and engage in a kind of Socratic dialogue with oneself through language I found really quite, really quite compelling. Yeah, that's, um, I also remember doing the research for that and thinking I was very surprised to learn that Anne Frank had made that decision before they went into hiding. So here she was, a quite popular young girl at school with lots of friends in her day-to-day -day life, and yet she still needed that perfect companion or that kindred spirit in a way. Uh, she puts it in a, in a specific phrase, but, um, but that she still felt that she was lacking and she needed to fill that void somehow with, with her diary writing. Um, very interesting. By, by the way, that model, that model I think helps answer the question uh, in a way that I've never answered it for myself before of, of human liberty uh, and that is that we are we are not ourselves a single thing uh, uh, we may be ultimately so we may have ultimate integrity uh, but but approximately we might have more than oneself that in a sense uh, freedom uh, what, what we're talking about of, as agency would require oneself to persuade oneself or to represent oneself. I think that you, your piece opens up the possibility that <clears throat> representation and reflection are enough, uh, that there need not be uh, uh, a persuasion per se, but that there can be uh, instead representation. And in that sense, it's, we, we may actually already be talking about poetics as well as, mm -hmm. as, uh, as rhetoric, as students of literature <laughs> that, we, uh, that we are. That we are exactly. So there's another question. Then again, I'm I'm trying to I've been trying to frame questions so that we can think about this practically for listeners who want to. Um, I mean, we're talking about personal writing, keeping a journal, keeping a diary. Um, I think it might be useful to hear your thoughts on more public forms of writing, in this context. And and then I and then I do have another question to put to you. Um, for the practical application of this. But why don't you go ahead and, and tell us a little bit about public spheres of writing that we can 
involve ourselves in. Yeah, very. Uh, I'd love love to love to. So um, drawing drawing not uh, this time on Plato, but instead on Aristotle. I've been um, fascinated by by the possibility that the three that the three genres that he talks about, uh, political and legal and ceremonial might actually encompass a good deal of, uh, of our, uh, a good number of our speech acts uh, day, day to day. And the reason that I've been thinking about this is I've been thinking, well, during, during uh, political or deliberative rhetoric, we, we do, we deliberate. We try to persuade or dissuade either ourselves or others with respect to the goods we hope to achieve. And then uh, in, in legal, we hope to uh, you know, prosecute or defend with respect to the, to the just. Uh, and in ceremonial rhetoric, we praise and blame with respect to the beautiful or the noble. And I, I ask a question of students when I'm, when I'm uh, teaching, and I've learned a lot from their responses, and I'll just ask, well, do you, do you think that, that this encompasses all uh, all speech acts, and of course they immediately say no. Uh, uh, but then, you know, we start to talk about it, and what we realize is it's quite encompassing uh, that to uh, that to that to seek the good or the just uh, or the or the beautiful and noble through through language may be what we're doing, if not all the time, most of the time. And so I've started thinking about social media and our exchanges via, uh, via, via the internet. Um, and there's more writing being done now by more people than ever historically. I have no numbers to support that, uh, um, but I'm, I'm positive that, it's the, that it is the case. I mean, I myself am, uh, writing and receiving email all day. We, we all are. Uh, I text back and forth probably with uh, good 20 to 25 uh, uh, people, even not counting text, uh, text chains. There's a new form of writing being born, it seems to me. Uh, the, the email is not quite as formal as the, as the letter, and yet it is a form of uh, epistolary, epistolary rhetoric. Uh, text is even less formal. It took me a while, for example, as an, as an old dog learning a new trick to realize that I needed to be very careful with periods in texts uh, because they, they presume a kind of finality that text culture <laughs> frowns upon. And even more than that, it took me probably, uh, I'm still having trouble with, uh, with the exclamation <laughs> mark because because I grew up being told never use the exclamation or very very seldom and you know we I think we all associated it with the kind of writing where eyes were dotted with hearts uh, and and now uh, I find myself uh, employing it employing it all of the time but the the reason I bring up both of those forms uh, uh, email and text is because I actually do think that uh, straightforward principles of the art of rhetoric uh, would, they can, uh, improve this art of soul leading that we're engaged in uh, through, these, through these particular forms uh, of, of, of language, these particular media. And of course it goes, it goes without saying that we live in a, a, a volatile uh, and socially uh, disrupted moment in which many of us are having trouble uh, speaking or writing to and with one another. And I do wonder whether, then there are many causes to that, I would not want to be reductive, but I think one of the causes of that is that we've lost the traditional art of rhetoric that helps us adjudicate those. And we tend to think, think that they don't pertain, uh, and the reason we think they don't pertain is because these new forms obviously didn't exist in the ancient uh, in the ancient world, and so uh, uh, it 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 does seem to me incumbent upon upon those of us who are fortunate enough to to teach uh, to teach people, especially young people, arts of language, uh, to try to equip them with the art of rhetoric, such that their the particular forms that they're employing can be uh, can be 
helpful uh, for the for the flourishing for the flourishing life. And so I wonder if the principles don't still pertain, though the particular forms have uh, have changed, and whether the study of the art might not improve. Um, not simply contemporary discourse in a broad way, but improve people's individual lives. Um, a lot of people are going amiss <laughs> in emails. A lot of people are going amiss in in texts, uh, and uh, it often it often actually brings about great great unhappiness uh, in a variety of, of ways. I think we all probably have our our own personal stories about such, and it just seems to me that the art. Uh, the art could as- could assist us. Yeah, it's funny listening to you talk. There's this um, thinking about this context and the potential for miscommunication. Uh, thinking about um, the gift of representation that we can um, acquire through practicing the art of rhetoric. Um, you know, there's a there is a darkness. I think. Um, when you when you don't know how to employ language and it affects your thoughts it affects your relationships it affects your communication um and there's this lovely lovely quotation um i'm going to quote george Eliot because i just don't think i can have a conversation without quoting her at least once um when she was with her partner george henry lewis who is a scientist biologist um, and they were at a seaside town in England, and they were preparing um, his his work for a, his seaside studies book. So they were spending their days looking in tide pools and walking through country lanes and um, doing a lot of specific naming of what they came across um, as as Lewis was cataloging um, information. And and so in her journal at one point during that, George Eliot wrote. Um, She said, I never before longed so much to know the precise names of things. And she says, the desire is part of this um, tendency that is now constantly growing in me to escape um, what is vague and inaccurate into the daylight of distinct, vivid ideas. And that image of moving from one to escape, you know, she's talking about escaping this idea of liberty. I think really resa- like, uh, fits with that, and um, and just this image of darkness to daylight that she's metaphorically alluding to. Um, there's just so much to to take away from rhetoric. I think that we we don't quite realize just how how useful and important it is for our emotional, spiritual, and not just academic selves. Um, so this kind of brings me to the question that I was alluding to earlier, with where do we start? And I've, I've gleaned some of the resources that I like to use, and I've picked two that I think represent very different approaches. Um, they don't, neither of them deal specifically with rhetoric, but um, with just the act of writing itself. So the first one is um, a book by Natalie Goldberg, who's a writer um, who writes a lot about the practice of writing in terms of meditation practices. So she uh, wrote a book in the 1980s called Writing Down the Bones, Freeing the Writer Within. And uh, she focuses a lot on originality and the fact that we just need to sit and we just need to write. Um, I think she focuses mainly on personal writing, but that can develop into something more. And she, she advises that we write about the objects around us, our everyday lives, our imagined lives, um, that we let thoughts, the thoughts that we have come out onto the page, uh, stream through us, let the metaphors organically appear, and, um, and that we don't censor or second guess ourselves. So, so she's emphasizing receptivity, practice, courage, um, openness. So it's a very creative, in a way, alluring approach to writing, I think. The other approach, though, is a lot more traditional, and it focuses on imitation. And I found this book um, that I just started reading. I really enjoy it. It's called The Writer's Workshop, Imitating Your Way to Better Writing by Gregory Roper, who's also, I think, 
at the University of Dallas. And then you're mentioned in the acknowledgments, so I knew you would, you would uh, maybe be familiar <laughs> with this book. He's, um, a, he's a colleague of mine here. Yeah, so, so this book, it's you know, based on the idea that we need to apprentice ourselves to writing masters. So we need to pick up Shakespeare, Milton, Jane Austen, Henry James, George Eliot, and we need to read, imitate, revise, read, imitate, revise, and gradually store up within ourselves these de you know, deposits of, of vocabulary and syntax. And then when we do sit down to write our original thoughts and ideas, uh, these, these will come to our aid. So um, I'm just thinking they, it represents this, you know, do we write through imitation? Do we write creatively and originally? Do we do both? Do we alternate? And where does rhetoric fit in with these two practices? Um, I would just like to hear your thoughts, I think, on those two approaches. No, oh, very, very rich, very rich terrain. Um, just before answering or responding uh, to those two uh, visions, uh, visions of writing, I wanted to back up and respond to the, the Eliot uh, quote, which I thought was just, mag just magnificent. Um, because I do, I do think that it's easy to forget just how extraordinary it is that, that human beings have the capacity uh, to name uh, and to to name all of the 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 elements of uh, of the of the cosmos from the from the largest to the to the smallest and uh, this uh, in the in the biblical tradition of course this is uh, you know this is the gift this is the gift to uh, to Adam and Eve that they can name and so I think the first thing we need to do is to acquire, whether we recover it or not, I don't know, but uh, to acquire a love, a love of uh, words, of language itself for, for naming, uh, for being able to name the substances and the attributes that we're trying to uh, understand and, and express. And the second, the second part of what I really do think of as the miracle of, of language, even having uh, read uh, in linguistics and understanding that this may very well be a natural, uh, a natural faculty that we have, uh, none, nonetheless, I think of predication itself, not just naming but predicating, as a, an extraordinary attribute of the human to be able to put together um, uh, a subject and a verb which have never been brought together before in order to, to understand uh, oneself and another and to move both toward, um, you know, a deliberative good or uh, a, a judicial uh, uh, form of justice or uh, a, ceremonial, a ceremonial form of beauty. And I think these are just... Um, remarkable attributes of us as as human beings. I'm actually preparing to teach a class in the fall in the art of the sentence. And a number of students uh, signed up for the class but did so skeptically. Uh, I already know how to write a sentence. And what I plan on doing is, is actually trying to uh, introduce them or reintroduce them to the wonder of language itself, uh, specifically in this case our own English language, and the the remarkable number of things that we can do with it, uh, uh, all all at least apparently infinite to a to a finite being like my like myself. When you think about the variety of styles uh, of, available uh, to us in the tradition, uh, really quite really quite remarkable. So I did just want to to riff on the miracle of language because I can't resist I can't resist uh, doing so, but it raises that that topic itself raises this topic about uh, you know creation v imitation, and I think that uh, I think both forms are required. So to answer your question, I think we we absolutely need both, uh, and uh, I do I do think generally speaking those of us who teach uh, do better uh, generally with imitation 
because one of the things we want to do is introduce students to the forms that the writing can 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 take can take place in. We we rely much too heavily, of course, on the on the essay, but uh, there are whatever the form, whether you're you know teaching students, <coughs> excuse me, or encouraging them to keep a, a journal or to write a scene or a short story, to write a non-academic uh, uh, essay or a dialogue or, or a poem, that all of these have formal properties that I just think teachers naturally gravitate, gravitate toward. It gives you something to talk about uh, at, the, at the board, uh, but it also empowers the students because they can see something that has been, that has been done. Uh, they can see the contours of it. Uh, and then they can they can imitate. Uh, tracing is easier than drawing, but most artists uh, have practiced have practiced both in the development uh, in the development of their of their art itself. Um, I I will tell you that as a as a traditionalist as a student of Shakespeare, uh, whose creativity uh, at least in my interpretation was enabled by imitation. I tend to be, as is Professor Roper, a big fan of imitation. Indeed, uh, part of my class on the sentence will involve imitating uh, different styles. And so, you know, what would it be like to write a sentence like Henry James? What would it be like to write a, a sentence uh, like, uh, like Virginia Woolf? What if you tried to translate a, a Woolf sentence into a James style and that sort of, and that sort of thing? But the whole idea is that from that imitation, however, one can begin to invent and create one's own style. And this is why I, I think it's very important not to neglect, neglect the other model, the model of, of, uh, of meditation. Uh, contemplation in your, in your reading or paying attention in the, in the, earlier, in the earlier description that you, that you used and it seems to me that if one, uh, that if one is trained, if you will, uh, and I don't mean just in school. I mean I think if one pays attention to the language that one is reading, uh, whether it be a novel one is reading or uh, an, an, an essay in the new in the New Yorker, an email from a from a uh, friend or a colleague or a family member who's uh, who's a good Who's a good writer? I have a I have a brother-in-law who's particularly good at texting, and I have started to pay attention to his texts quite quite carefully, and even at uh, at times to imitate him. Uh, he has a marvelous way of of uh, bringing out humor in a very short in a very short form, and I've been I've been tracking it a little bit uh, uh, and uh, and. And having a go, having a go at it, at it, my, at it myself, but I do think that this this paying attention, imitating, and then allowing oneself to pay attention without being quite so conscious of the forms you've imitated, I think that's an extremely, extremely important, uh, important activity. And so I, I, I tend to think of those as as counterparts to one another. Uh, we need to imitate, and we need to innovate. And they tend to to fructify one another. I think if they're if they're done uh, not necessarily at the same time, uh, but if they're done together. Yeah, and I think this hits on a really important aspect to anyone who wants to write and and better themselves and better their writing is is um, that relationship between writing and reading. You know that you really can't have one without the other, and you can't really have reading without writing in some in some respect either even if it's even if the words don't actually end up on a page somewhere or a screen it reading does something to the way that you think and and improves it i think um of course it depends on what you're reading but um if we're talking about literature then i think it it definitely makes a difference um so this i did want to touch on reading i think we're we're, we're are coming Please. up against it and discussing it, but you know, um, it would be remiss to talk about writing with, without referring to reading directly. I think, um, and so I mean, I I think it's important to open up the activities of reading and writing for non-academics and in non-academic spaces. I think there's a lot of fruitful um, activity for self and others in that. 
Um, but also it, we can't dilute or weaken these pursuits either. Um, I think it's, uh, it's not very helpful to tell someone that reading is easy or writing is easy um, because they are crafts and they, are, they do require skill and they do require practice and they are lifelong pursuits, you know, I mean, there's a reason for that. Um, so if, if you have some more to say, I think on the interconnection between those two skills, um, and again, thinking about this as a life skill, writing as a life skill, I think now we can talk about reading as a life skill, um, and just touching on the way these improve us. Um, I'll just mention for your class, you you might already be familiar with this, but you know I'm I'm very intrigued by your by your class on writing a sentence. Um, there's a, a great book, First You Write a Sentence by Joe Moran. That's another uh, book that I've come across um, and have found really useful for my writing. And, um, and every single sentence in the book itself, you know that, you know, he knows that his readers will be analyzing each sentence because he's writing a book on how to write a sentence. And um, he never bends under that pressure. You know, each sentence is very well constructed and very, um, uh, brings more, brings something to the content, I think, the way that each one is formed. Um, and then there's some really wonderful insights about et etymologies and the way that we employ certain certain words in, in that book. Um, but I digress. So, um, so what what would you what would you suggest or or add to this interconnection between reading and writing as life skills? Yeah, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful uh, question. Um, the first thing that I would say is that if, if we're all doing uh, more writing than has ever been uh, uh, done uh, in the history of the world, I think we're also doing more reading. Uh, most of us are online a good deal, a good deal of our day, and we're reading uh, a great deal. But the, the, the productivity of uh, of the internet, the need for quote unquote content, means that uh, we are we are surrounded by by language, some of which is superb and some of which isn't. And so the first thing that I would say is that one life skill is is to take a break. Uh, I think from the um, the normal reading that we do and to attend uh, to more carefully written. Uh, uh, books, uh, and so here, here I'm afraid I would I would <laughs> at this point you know our listeners are thinking a couple of English teachers here we go uh, at this point I would say well I I really do think it's a matter of reading well written well written books especially I must say in one's in one's own language uh, English is just a remarkable remarkable language and we're. Uh, we are so fortunate to have so much uh, beautiful, beautiful English prose. And so, you know, my recommendation would be to read. Uh, that every time one's attention is attracted to a text that's, that's discussed, uh, for example, during, you know, during our, our show, if, if one hasn't read Anne Frank, uh, uh, do so, for example, and, and so on and so forth. And so the first thing I would say would be to to take a break uh, from uh, from the internet and 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 read a book. And the second thing I would say is that while one is doing so, to to on occasion uh, during that that contemplative uh, activity of of reading and enjoying what you're reading, note a sentence or two. Um, I mean, there is a there is a tradition of keeping uh, keeping a journal of favorite of favorite quotations, uh, copy book, and I would I would recommend it myself. I plan on recommending it to my to my students, but I'd recommend it to anybody. Simply copying out a very finely written sentence is itself, I think, uh, a wonderful a wonderful activity. And then my third recommendation would be to, to pay attention when one's writing one's own sentences, uh, in, including in forms that encourage speed. Um, most of us, I know, have such uh, vivid experiences of being hurried uh, to both read and to write. Uh, I mean, 
I myself feel that I will offend someone if I don't respond to their email in, in, in quote unquote real time. And it's even more the case with, with texting. And, and so I've had to try to train myself to slow down a little bit and remember that this is, you know, this is going to be composed of sentences that have to be read by a human being <laughs> uh, to remind myself of the, of, the, uh, of the manners, if you will of speaking and writing to others. And so the, the third aspect of that uh, is that as one is moving from reading uh, to, to copying and copying to writing, uh, that, one, that one slow down and pay, pay attention. I think attention is a, is a significant topic for our age. I think many of us, I, I'll speak for myself, I'm having trouble paying attention uh, these days. There's too much, it comes at me too quickly, and I'm responsible for too many things. And so I'm having to find ways to, to govern that, to try to uh, regain my attention uh, and my ability to give myself the, the mental space that I think you, you described so well again in your, in your essay conversing with oneself, to give myself that space uh, to, to write uh, uh, sentences uh, for the, the person receiving the email uh, or, or, the, or the text such that it improves our lives as opposed to, to diminishing them. And so keeping the beautiful, the good, the just in view as we write and compose our sentences especially in relationship to the language itself that we are that we are using and which again uh, is our singular attribute uh, it it is arguably the very thing that makes us that makes us human and so I think I think if I had any any final thing to say it would be that uh, we should think of both reading and writing but also listening and speaking as the activities that help us become uh, distinctly and more uh, and more richly human. Well, Scott, thank you so much for, for joining us here and for talking to Renovatio's listeners. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you. Likewise, uh, a, a delight. Uh, I feel quite fortunate uh, uh, being able to participate in this and thank you so much for your essay and for, uh, and for your questions. Yeah, thank you for your kind words. I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm.